did a change. And so I put together an application to um, graduate school and I got in and the rest is kind of history. I moved here um, in 2012. So um, all of that I mentioned because math and architecture and helicopter flying and maps and charts and engines and all that kind of stuff. That really goes into my work at a subconscious level. I don't try to channel it consciously. It's just, it's part of how I think. It's part of what I'm fascinated with, with line work and diagrams. So it's just, it's just sort of techno babble kind of emerged on its own from all of that. So, yeah. That's right. amazing. I didn't, I didn't realize that you uh, had such a math background and were a real pilot and all of that. That's incredible. I, I don't know how I didn't realize, like I read it, but I yeah. didn't imagine it before. Yeah, I think that, um, I, you know, I really identify with the Renaissance, uh, like Leonardo da Vinci drew, drew his, in his sketches and his paintings, he, he drew um, the first known sketch of a, of a helicopter. You know, it's sort of a really interesting diagram that he drew. But he had that mind, that sort of left brain, right brain mind to study mathematics, to study painting. And um, all of the masters back then were, were Renaissance men. They were, they were multi-talented and multi-educated. Um, and so I just kind of uh, never thought that um, I would become an artist. I always thought it would be, I don't know, aviation or other things, but uh, art has always been there through my life, especially during the most difficult times, right? The, the times where I was um, coming out of the closet, dealing with personal issues. Um, even now, like how many of us during this lockdown, during this quarantine have started to create more? You know, I, I've actually, my creativity has gone up since uh, quarantine began, you know, it, whether I'm in the studio here alone or whether I'm in my apartment, I'm just like drawing on everything, you know, I just can't, can't stop creating. And I think that gets us through these times. And I think that gives us a reason to get through these times. So, yeah. That's, an, that's incredible. Um, and it's so inspiring and just drawing and painting on everything. And can you tell us more about that? <laughs> Of some of your surfaces and your yeah. and, oh, and what is techno babble? I'm sorry. What is techno babble? And when did that become a thing? Techno babble. Here I have a uh, uh, an example. Um, my friend Jake is here, so I'll, I'll give a shout out to him. Jake and I talked about doing these drawings on glass because we want to do. Um, we want to do some photography using this, you can see like using these designs as sort of a way to develop them or shoot through them or create multi layers and stuff. But, um, you know, one of the biggest things that happened for me last year was that I, I, my heart is still in the oil painting. All these paintings behind me are, are in oil, but I started drawing in ink. I started painting in ink. I started, uh, doing murals on, um, you know, with latex black paint. I started painting on glass and on paper and vellum, and then I would scan these things and uh, turn the scans into digital files and then fabricate skateboards and fabricate hoodies and, you know, make t-shirts. And some of you, like, watching today have bought some of my t-shirts and hoodies. So it's just, like, I can't stop putting my stuff on on any surface I can find. I just did, um, I didn't give a picture of it. I did two dresser drawers for a friend of mine uh, on commission that I just finished this, this week. And, uh, you know, that was a new medium. I was painting in lacquer and chrome. I was painting with a chrome uh, paint and also with lacquer. So I'm just branching out and seeing how many other things I can do with this interesting line work, this techno babble. Techno babble is just, it's this crazy network of interconnecting forms and shapes. It's all just basic lines and squares, dots, triangles, circles, you know, it's nothing, it's nothing uh, complicated individually, but I put it together into this puzzle. So it's just kind of 
It's called techno babble. Yeah. It seems it's so metaphoric of the, the pathways and kind of the life journeys and complexities. I, I really enjoy looking at all those movements. It's almost like a game because uh, I think there's a playfulness as yeah. well. Yeah. And, and that's, why, that's why I like keeping it abstract. You know, a lot of uh, friends, you know, I, I don't, I intentionally avoid creating something that's recognizable, like, a symbol or a mathematical um, equation or um, some astrological sign or whatever because I want the meaning to stay abstract and so people bring their own experience to the art and so when somebody who's studied biochemistry looks at my work they they ask me if I'm a scientist and, and what what does it all mean and when somebody is um, really into maps and stuff then you know, they, they see maps, they see, they see city plans, or they see microorganisms, whatever they bring to, to, the, um, to the conversation as a viewer, they see in the work. And so um, as an abstract artist, I still consider myself abstract, even though every move has a purpose to it. Every move has to connect with the next move and everything has to fit together. Uh, techno babble just, it, it, it's evolved with, you know, I started sketching things back in, uh, in graduate school when I was studying architecture and uh, put it down for a while and then sort of revisited it and, and it just sort of came into being by itself. I didn't like force it. It was only until like, you know, I don't know how you work, Charlotte, but when I create something, I just sort of follow my gut. I just do my thing. I think about it. I make thoughtful decisions. But it's only in retrospect that we get to analyze things and really figure out what it all means. Um, techno babble is just, it's an abstract technological diagram that I like putting on every surface I can find. <laughs> so that's uh, what. Oh, I want to thank Todd for putting techno babble and the definition in the chat, uh, in, incomprehensible technical jargon. Yes, <laughs> it, is, it is incomprehensible. So it's meant to be. Yeah, that's, that's very cool. I have some of these images. I'd, I'd love to share them. And um, I think yeah. now, now would be a good time and you could tell us a bit more about them. Yeah, um, let's go. So. I'm sorry, hold on. Let me fix this here. Okay. I'm watching the screen with you here. Great. I'm sorry, I spoke a second too soon. Um, I could... Um, Here we go. Okay. Great. Yeah, these, uh, these are uh, recent works. This is all 2020. So, I don't know what to say. The one on the left um, is actually my most recent painting on canvas. And it's it's really this really thick, bold techno babble. It's like the billboard font in your, in your uh, font selection. The one on the right is, um, is thinner, but it's, they're all kind of doing the same thing. They're all speaking the same language. Um, the thing that I, the one on the right, if you stand in front of it, the black line work is, a, is an opaque matte black. And the background that it's against is really why I'm an oil painter, because it's got a, a luminescent pink background that, that is covered up by these bronze layers. And so it looks metallic. It's meant to look metallic. It's meant to look industrial. And then the, the techno babble layer on top of everything just adds my signature to it. That's awesome. Both. That one's in the studio, right? Yeah, it's right here. Uh, we can take a closer look at it in a second. These are both, uh, to get some scale, these are both four feet wide by five feet tall. Um, this price range, this, this uh, size canvas that I, that I have, they all sell for 7,000. So that's sort of where I, the scale that I'm at at, at this, mm -hmm. at a four by five. That's, that's good to know. And then, yeah, this was an oil painting I did, the yellow one, 
Um, I did a long time ago and I was really happy with it, but Technobabble sort of grew after it. And so I was always looking at it as a possibility as just a background piece. And so I ended up uh, painting over it. If you can, it, it's, it's meant to look like a very oil painting underneath, a very abstract sort of William Turner kind of a scene. And then on top of it is this bold, bright yellow, this cadmium yellow. So very that's, that's sort of the style I'm going for lately is the sort of thick um, geometrics with the square points and the square, the square, uh, everything is squared off and, and edge. And then the, the uh, skateboard, that's my latest skateboard. I just had that fabricated and shipped here like a week or two ago. That, so, that's so cool. Do you skate? Yeah, I, I sometimes I'll, uh, I don't have it with me today, but sometimes I'll skate from the, the subway to my studio and, uh, and then back again. But Very cool. I don't like riding the subway right now. I, I'd rather just be on a city bike with my mask on, you know? Yeah, that, that makes sense to me. And uh, the shoes, are those real? Those are real Vans. Uh, Vans has a customized... Um, you can customize shoes with Vans, and so I send my designs in, and it takes a while, but they come back uh, custom printed, and you can get them in any size, men's, women's, they're all in my, I have a, a sort of a merch apparel website with the skateboards and the hoodies, it's called paulmichaelstudios.com, so I could, we could provide that info later, but a lot of you have already bought stuff from there, so the hoodie's a big seller, and everybody loves the hoodie. Yeah. Yeah, these are, the, these are the dressers I just finished. So this was a, um, a project that we had been talking about for a couple months. Um, my friend, uh, our friend, Walter, um, has these two sort of just very simple geometric uh, custom dresser drawers, but they were um, just painted like a cream white, you know, nothing special. And then I went over it with my blue lacquer techno babble, and then if you zoom, I don't know if you can zoom in on that, Charlotte, but like, it's not just the chrome layer uh, of techno babble on top; it's two other blue layers underneath. So it's just my my work is multi-layered. Uh, I mean, most of it, 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 I like adding layer upon layer upon layer. It makes it it makes it three-dimensional. It makes it really compelling from the front all the way to the back because you're, you're looking through several several screens of Technobabble several so but what was great about the the quarantine is that it gave it's you know things kind of shut down and slowed down so my friend Walter and I were um were talking at the beginning of quarantine hey this would be a good time to do those dressers because it'll keep me working and um, there's nothing really else to do right now. So I'm very grateful for that commission. It really kept April, um, I was very busy in April. I had that commission and I had a mural uh, commission. I think you have a time lapse of the mural too, right? I do, I do. I'd love, I'd love to share that. Yeah. yeah. Here we are. Yeah, so this is, this is Soho Tattoo. It's down on Lafayette and Canal in, in uh, Manhattan here. And um, I was commissioned to paint this wall. They wanted to do a small wall, but I looked at the main big wall across the entire space. I was like, no, I want to do the big wall. And so it's about, um, I don't know, 50 by 5, <laughs> whatever that dimension is. It goes off screen to the left and off screen to the right. So I'm right, I'm right about halfway through at this point. And um, I'm using, I'll show you in a minute. I'm using a, a foam roller and I'm using just flat um, black latex house paint. Yeah. So it's nothing, it's nothing special, but it's permanent up there and um, it'll, it'll make the place really stand out. So this is, this is one of the reasons I do art, you know, is because this sort of, it's just, it's just my techno babble. It's just black lines on a white background, but it adds, it adds a, a quality to the space. It changes the space and 
people walking by on the sidewalk are going to notice. Whether or not they want to come in for a tattoo or a piercing is, is not the point. It's, it's that they're going to notice and they're going to see how this space has changed just because this one wall has an artist's work on it. Mm -hmm. And how, is this, how many murals have you done? Or, you know, I guess that was part of the expanding of, oh, I want your, your art to be everywhere. Or... Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I started, uh, I did a, a bathroom um, that took me, because I was working a little bit here and there, that took me um, a long time to finish. Um, this one I'm working about, um, I don't know, maybe, one or two days a week like nothing it's not it's not that we're in a rush to finish because uh, tattoo parlors are not going to be the first ones to reopen um here's what i wanted to show you this is just a cheapo foam roller uh that i'm using for that project i cut it i cut it with a razor blade to the to the line width that i that i feel comfortable with for the project and I'm going over that in that time-lapse video. You can see me painting, and it's with this. I'm using a roller tray and a roller, and I'm painting those squares and everything with, with a roller. So this has become my latest new fun tool to use. Um, and I'm doing this also on the, uh, the big, bold painting here in, in behind me. So. And people are asking if you draw the design first for the mural, especially, Totally freehand. How much do you plan map ahead? Totally freehand. That that is such control with those foam brushes um, yeah. of, of when to stop. Because I know I just want to like, whoa, here I go, my whole arm. <laughs> yeah, I you know, here's a good exercise for any anyone, whether you're an artist or not. Try drawing something with ink only. No um, pencils, no sketches. Just go straight to it. Just Write in your journal and ink. Um, draw a painting from start to finish without erasing anything. You know, if you make a mistake, roll with it. Just keep, make it part of the design, you know. Uh, that's what I do. So I, I just let the design create itself. Um, I sort of think as I'm moving down the wall from left to right, I think, oh, I want, I need something over here to balance this out, or I want a big shape here, or I want something down here. And so I, I'm making it up as I go along, but everything is, a, is an intentional connection to another thing, you know? Um, so sometimes I have to stop, take a step back, and try to decide, well, how does that shape connect to there? And do I just draw a straight line, or do I make connections, or do I make patterns? And everything has to sort of fit, you know? There's sort of a, there's a logic behind it that I, I'm kind of married to, you know? So yeah. yeah I, I don't, I don't sketch it out. I don't sit there with a pad and paper and say, okay, over here, I want that shape. No, I just go for it. I just go for it. That's, that's incredible. I just, I love that you've defined this, you know, visual vocabulary for yourself. And it's such a signature too. I think it's so recognizable. Um, yeah. I, I, and, and yet it's, it's unique to me because it's sort of come out of me. I don't, I don't know anyone else who has this sort of style or sort of language. But yet, at the same time, um, you know, it, it reminds people of Keith Haring right now. Or some of my earlier, messier line work with Technobabble was more uh, reminiscent of Basquiat. So people are seeing other artists, and those are certainly artists that have influenced me. But um, I'm not trying to channel any one person or any one thing into it. I'm just letting it do its thing. I just, I just have fun doing it along the way. So it's, I mean, to be honest, Charlotte, sometimes I, I'll sit back and I'll look at a, a section of a painting that I drew like months ago. And I'm like, man, what was I thinking? I have no idea how that fits together, but it works. You know, I just, I just kind of like look at it. I was like, oh, I've never done that shape before. Or I haven't done that shape in a while. Like, it just kind of evolves and it does its own thing, so. It's so cool. Um, yeah. So one thing about your paintings, and you mentioned this during the slideshow, is that the way they change with the different light and the way they move oh, around. Yeah. So yeah. maybe we could start to take a peek around. Yeah, you yeah are. Let's do that. Um, I'm gonna take, take you on a little tour. Um, let me flip you around. So. 
here is one of those paintings I was telling you about where the black line work is this flat matte opaque line work but then underneath sorry let me try to underneath you can see that there's a sort of a bronze finish to this painting and yet you can see also that there's also pink you know there's little little pink dots and stuff so um here is a painting I'd finished just before like Armory Week, you know, when all the shows were. And I finished it, um, it's 10 feet high. And the final layer of Technobabble is uh, this silver paint. And so, you know, you can kind of see your reflection as you move around, but then as you get with light behind you, as, as the light sort of follows you around, then it turns into this dark gray. And so at some point it's dark gray, and then at another point it's the it's the white line. So it all depends on what angle you're looking at. It makes it very difficult to photograph. <laughs> Let me back up for you. So this is my space. I've got half of the studio to myself. I've got old paintings stacked up, ready to sell. I've got new paintings that are like ready to move out. I've got this big one, which is still a canvas pinned up on the wall that I've been working on for months. And got some stretcher bars. I've got my awesome Techno Babble mini fridge, which I painted uh, during Open Studios this year. And we've got this lovely view of Hudson Yards. And check this out. This is how close I am to the High Line. Yeah, it's just, I mean, I, I'm just, whenever I come in here, I'm just, just in heaven, you know, the smells of an oil painting studio and just in the summertime across the, uh, across the way you get live music. It's just, it's just kind of such a great place to, be, to live and, and work. I don't live in the studio. I'm, I, I'm moving to Chelsea soon, but this is just, once I moved in here, Charlotte, I was like, I can't ever leave, so. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Yeah. Oh, yeah. you just took me on memory lane because I used to work in that building, and I know it's it. It's a great building. Yeah. It's, uh, it's so surreal right now because, like, I, I have a key to the front door. I walk in, and it's just no one's here, you know. Um, I'm just fortunate to be healthy and be able to, like, walk in the studio alone and take off my mask and just work and then and then get on a city bike and go home, so, yeah. I have a question about your process. I see you have the, the raw canvas up on the wall. Um, yeah. It's not, it's not stretched. It was stretched. So oh. the way, it, I, I could show you that too. Um, the way I work when I work on a wall, and most of my paintings, they need to sort of go on a wall first because I do, a lot of layering that requires a hard surface behind the canvas. So like all these metallic paints and everything were sort of like rubbed or, or shined on the canvas. So there's a lot of reflection in the canvas there. But it was stretched on a stretcher bar. You can see the, uh, the imprints left by the, the stretcher bars here. And so that's where the frame goes. And so when I put this back on the frame, the canvas will remember the canvas will remember where to go and sometimes I'll prime it on the on the frame and then put it on the wall put it back on the frame finish it on the okay. frame so I'm going back and forth so I it's not just like I stretch it once and that's it I'll stretch it I'll work it I'll put it on the wall I'll work it on there I'll put it back on so it's back and forth that is so labor intensive it is, but it's so worth it. I mean, I, I, need, I need like a, a flat, hard surface behind the canvas. When I was working uptown, I, I put um, like flat boards behind the pre-stretched canvas just so I could have a hard surface to press against. Mm -hmm. I, it was, that was more labor intensive to me than pinning this up on the wall, so. But yeah, I, I need, I need that, that hard wall to, to paint against. And that's why, that's why painting on, um, on those dressers with, with lacquer and chrome was so much fun because 
it was a hard surface. And when, when you have a hard surface like that, you can use a chrome paint because it'll, it'll create that mirror effect, like a little, a mirrored circuit diagram or something like that. That's very cool. Very cool. And, and you mentioned the metallic paints. Are those an oil, an oil? What kind of metallic oil are you yeah. working uh, with? I don't know if I have. Yeah, I you, you can, they're really expensive. Like a, uh, let me see this. See, I got, um, I got copper. Um, <laughs> like one of uh, this size in, in uh, silver costs like 50 bucks, you know, from Blick. But um, I don't know, this is a pale gold metallic. I was using that on a painting. Um, yeah, you can buy metallics. But what's difficult to find is neon, and I haven't gotten into neon or fluorescence because that's a little bit out there for oil, but I could, I could maybe go that way. I, I love the metallic and the areas of reflective or not reflective. It is, it is really interesting. We've got a couple questions in the chat. Have you ever done yeah. a floor? Yeah, go ahead. Open it up. I, I can't read it. Oh, have you done a floor? Oh, have I done a floor? Um, I mean, when I was doing, uh, uh, when, when I was, oh, I was like in my 30s, I was, I was renovating like my house, my kitchen, and I was doing actual flooring, like tiles and stuff, and it was a pain. It was really hard. Um, but no, I haven't done, it, it'd be, I did, I almost did this one project, and it never got off the ground, but what it was going to be, we were working with Chelsea Tile and Stone, Chelsea Arts Tile and Stone down in, um, on 28th. And we were going to water jet cut my techno babble into uh, Pennsylvania blue slate. And then we were gonna put that on the floor of a shower. Um, so the shower pan needs to slope down in four directions to the drain. And so usually they cut the tile uh, usually they'll, they'll have like one inch tiles or something really small so that it can follow that grade down to the drain. But we were going to use techno babble line work to cut the tiles. And so it was going to be you're showering, you look down and all the grout at your feet would be my line work. That almost happened. Unfortunately, we didn't get it off the ground, but um, that would be really cool to do. So wow. I, almost, I almost got into flooring is your answer. I wish we could have done it. I kind of want to see a floor now. I, I kind of like want to take painting a cement floor and like doing all the top coat on it, pouring or whatever. That, I mean, that could be interesting, but what, what I'm saying here is that we were going to, we were going to actually laser or not laser etch, like water jet etch the blue slate into my patterns. And so the grout work, fitting all those puzzle pieces together, the grout would have been my line work, you know? So you would have been, standing on a piece of art. Wow. Do you know, I don't know. Maybe, maybe someday we can do that. Yeah, I see someone else is asking if you would do her feeling. Do you know Danielle? Danielle. I'll do, I'll do ceiling. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sure anyone who would like to get a private commission for a, a home <laughs> studio installation, um, yeah, I'm sure Paul would be very happy to do that for, um, so you could feel free to reach out to him via email. Yeah, the, the one thing I want to do, and I mean, techno babble is going to become three dimensional eventually. I just, I know it sculptures in my future. Um, I want, you know how Tracy Emin does her uh, little poetic signs on the wall? The truisms? Yeah, these, yeah, so it's just this little handwritten, like, uh, love, love poem, a little saying in neon lighting, neon tubing. Um, I want to do like a neon ceiling in techno babble. So, like, you look up and all the neon lighting is forming these, these techno babble shapes. Or I could just come paint your ceiling. <laughs> yeah, I could, just come, I, I, could, I, could, I could do the, uh, you know, it'll be really cool. 
the mural that, that we did the time lapse, that we showed the time lapse for, for uh, Soho Tattoo, that's very stark contrast, black on white, but for a ceiling, what I would do is like a, a white on white, something so subtle that like a glossy white of the same flat white black background so that you only see this glossy contrast. Now that could make a beautiful ceiling pattern and I could just sit up there like Michelangelo on one of those platforms and just paint the entire ceiling. Yeah, that would be awesome. I love that. That's very cool. Um, someone's also suggesting swimming pools with your grout tiling. Oh my gosh, yeah. Actually, I, I know a collector, we went to his house in Mamaroneck last year and he had custom art installation tiling on the inside of his swimming pool. That was very cool. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, once you get into this world of, of architectural and interior design, I mean, the possibilities are endless. Like, it's not just about putting ink on a paper or paint on a wall. It's about doing a, a you know, a, a brass inlay and a marble floor. It's about doing this custom work that just shows that you're more than just a decorator or a, um, I don't want to get into the crafty arts. Do you know what I mean? Uh, the decorative arts, which is it's an entirely different world. I want to stay within the fine art world of painting and sculpture, but the possibilities are really like unlimited once you get, once you go down that road and find new ways to put your art on things. The custom furniture is really stunning. I, I, I kind of want one of those myself. Um, oh, yeah, people, people, are, people are asking about, I guess you kind of just got into that with the neon a little bit about what your dream project what is my dream project? I've already done one dream project, and that was to do a, um, a canvas of this size. I'd always wanted to paint at that scale, and that's what got me into the studio. Um, I, I may have sent you that, that image, Charlotte, of the 14-foot um, canvas that's in uh, Pennsylvania in the dining room. Oh, yes. That was too big for my slide presentation. Uh, well, it's on my Instagram. Um, so one of my dreams has already come true to be able to paint at this scale. Uh, I just, I love working up to the ceiling on this stuff. So that's one thing. Uh, another dream project is to do uh, one of those five-story walk-up side of the building murals in, in Manhattan, like in the East Village, how they have like, uh, they have like an empty lot and this five-story building just has a blank wall on it, you know, and artists will get up there with, you know, the cherry picker and, and paint the entire wall from the ground floor up to the fifth floor. Like that would be an amazing project. Um, oh, what else? I want, to do, I want to work in neon lighting. I think that would be super cool. Um, I want to, <laughs> I want like my Vans tennis shoes and my hoodies. I want that to take off. <laughs> <laughs> like let let those designs get get bought out by some designer and, and put on a fashion label i'd be in heaven that would be a really cool present if anyone's looking for birthday presents yeah. or, friends or right you know, cousins or nieces or nephews okay. i mean we may, as well, we may as well try to sell it while we have this right. opportunity and everyone on the line right yeah. i think someone did put your um your website where you could buy merch in the chat box as well yeah paulmichaelstudios.com um Right, and paulmichaelgraves.com is where all my fine art is, so. I haven't found a way, um, you know, Charlotte, I'm doing so many different things. I'm doing the fine art, I'm doing the merch, and I'm, I haven't found a way to, I'm not gonna put it under one website. I think that'd be too confusing. So I'm just sending people to one thing or the other. It's just, it's just the way it works for me, I think, the best, but. I, I love the way you've, um, you know, just crossed all these, interesting boundaries with art and design and the custom work I think is is totally fascinating. Uh, we have a question about the lines filling up the canvas and thinking about the composition. Okay. Um, I was doing some work with Technobabble where I wasn't filling out the canvas edge to edge. I was just sort of centering, uh, sort of clustering everything in the middle as a sort of, uh, 
it's like I was drawing an object within a frame. And one of the things that I'm, I'm really, one of the qualities of abstract art that I love the most is that the frame disappears when you fill out the entire canvas. And so you're no longer painting an object within a window frame. The painting itself becomes the object in the room. So the painting, by filling out the canvas and by, by, by creating it, you're not painting an object within it, you're, you're painting an object itself. And so a painting of mine like this yellow one behind me hanging in the living room, the living room becomes the frame for that painting. Um, so that's one thought I have on filling out, on uh, filling out the canvas. But in terms of composition, um, I like to have, I guess I can show you with this, with this painting here. Um, I like to include a couple of like protagonists, right? So you can see this guy here in the middle is sort of like a central figure, but then he's like talking to this thing over here or this guy is talking to him like they're connecting to each other and they're interacting with each other there's also this guy down in the corner so there's like a player here 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 and here and it's sort of like they're all talking to each other but then they're connected and they're intersecting it's it's a very it's almost um it's, it's a very sort of sexual thing, you know, to have these shapes penetrating each other and crisscrossing and intersecting and overlapping and layered on top of each other because you don't know where one ends and another begins. And philosophically, I think that's very important for me because we don't know if we view the ecosystem as one organism. We don't know where the bee ends or the beehive ends and the flower begins because they rely on each other. So how, how can one exist without another, you know? So it's this idea that um, Deleuze comes up with, and I may be talking Greek to some people, but philosophers have talked about this idea of the world being one single organism or one rhizome that connects to everything else. And so the, the series that I mentioned earlier that I did in 2015 and 16 was called the Rhizome Series, and it was it was a mass of line work that wasn't techno babble, but it was getting there. Um, and I called it rhizome because it was like a knotted mass of roots and nests and stuff like that. Here it's no different. It's just now I'm connecting things, not literally line to line, but pattern to pattern or form to form or dot over here, dot over there. So things are still inter interconnecting. Does that answer someone's question about like why I'm, I'm connecting things in the way I am and make and sort of blurring the lines between those connections? I think so. I uh, did not see that yellow painting behind you is like figurative. And now that I've seen it as figurative, I can't unsee it. Yeah. I don't intend for these things to happen, but my friends sometimes stop by studio and watch me paint, at least before quarantine. And they do it all the time. They're like, oh, that guy over there, he's throwing up on this dude, and this guy's angry. And I, we, we, we anthropomorphize everything that we see, and we, we, we interject our own character and our own personality into these shapes. I'm just drawing lines. Like, this is just a drawing for the sake of drawing. But these stories kind of emerge because we, we put our own ideas into it. That is, that is so cool. Uh, this is the painting I think I forgot to put in the slideshow, this one here. Yeah, that's behind me. Yeah, this is the one behind you, but it's so interesting how it reads, um, you know, in this, in this photograph versus the way yeah. we see it behind you is very different. Um, yeah, I, I just uploaded this to um, um, my art advisor, Cynthia Burns' website, and I had to include a video of it, of me moving around because there's no other way to represent the different angles of light with just one photograph. So I, I had to include a video with it. I, I don't know how else to sell it without showing those different angles. You know? and these, these are just so beautifully complicated as well. I, I feel like- I, I like that. I, I, I might steal that from you, Be beautifully complicated. It sounds like my personality. <laughs> 
Yeah, <laughs> me too. Um, I would love to open this up for a little more conversation. Yeah. Um, so I am going to actually unspotlight you so that you can see some people. Great. Um, and then if anyone would like to ask a question, you can kind of wave or you can unmute yourself if you don't have that much background noise. I think I see some people moving. If you can't uh, find the raise your hand button, just wave your hand in the window and. Yeah, I can, I can see everybody. That's so cool. I love that. How many people do we have, Charlotte? Right now we have a group of 20 people here. Awesome. Um, which, is, which is very cool. Um, Oh, that's an interesting comment, Chris. I don't know if she's still here. Um, the larger paintings that they almost feel like a concert of people. I think especially that that big one. Yeah, it is. I mean, I could I could put a probably I could put like a voiceover track of like a, a party, you know, and <laughs> and you could sort of imagine each of these these little these little figures talking to each other. Um, I I do I, I do want to say one note. I. I title, I used to title everything untitled, which I think is what a lot of abstract artists do. But um, this series, I've, I, I, I title them figure. So figure 21, this is figure 29, I think it is. Um, so figure in the art world means the human form. So when you say you're a figure painter, that means you're painting the, uh, the male or the female nude on a chaise lounge or something like that. But, you're painting the human form, the figure. But in science and in textbooks, you, you look to the side and say reference figure A, and you look over and there's a diagram of a mitochondria or something like that, or you see a figure, uh, figure 21, and you, you go to this, the next page and you see figure 21 is some complex diagram of things. Um, so it's sort of a pun. It's sort of a play on words that I'm calling these figures. Because as one complex mass diagram, it's become one figure. Uh, so I call them figure whatever the number is. Um, but then within that, like you said, Charlotte, some of these little diagrams become figurative. They become, they have their own little personalities. They have their own little membranes and tentacles and maybe like a brain or an eye or something like that. So. They become figurative. It's, it's sort of blending the two together. I'm not trying to intentionally do any of this. I'm just like, you know, blowing hot air at this point. Anybody have any real questions? Uh, Jake, so talking, talking about figures and diagrams, do you think that there's any reference to documentation in the work at all? Any like documentation of anything of any sort, even if it's just within your own persona? Do, do you mean am I am I trying to um, am I trying to represent something with the diagram? Not like, necessarily represent, but do you? I mean, just do you feel any kind of connection to the idea of documentation when you're working? Um, I don't or know about the work in general. Not necessarily just when you're working. Do you mean like filming my process? Mm. Or do you or do you mean um, in the work itself using the work to reference something in particular it could be if that's the way you take it I don't know I was just wondering because like thinking about diagrams and figures in that way is very interesting for the idea of documentation so I was wondering yeah. just what you would say on that well I, I think what what I want to what I want to uh, what I want to keep is the abstraction so I don't want to, I don't want to say, okay, it's, it's a coronavirus pandemic. So I'm going to specifically paint something that says coronavirus. I would rather just do my thing. Let that represent whatever it brings to the viewer, whatever the viewer brings to it. Uh, because people see their own their own interpretation of things. I could tell you what I think something means. I could intentionally try to document the COVID crisis with a painting, but 
that's not how my creative process works. I follow the sort of hunches that I have and the ideas that I have, and I try to execute those well, but I don't try to force an idea. Um, I don't know if that, that yeah. answers it. Yeah, I mean, I know, I, I know, Jake, I know your work sometimes blends, it gets into the abstract world itself. So you're documenting an object, but I also see you painting in your photography, like a painter will just slash a thing of light across the canvas. You do that with your photography. So in essence, you're documenting an actual work, but then you're also making it abstract, which photography can do that. I'm, I'm just playing and just drawing things, but I'm yeah, not trying to. Awesome. Yeah. Chris, Chris Campbell. Oh, you have to unmute yourself, hold on. There we go. Am I unmuted now? Yeah. Okay. Um, is it a conscious choice to go on canvas and not a hard like aluminum or other contemporary materials that artists have been using to get that hard edge? Uh, I've, I've painted on board before and I really love it. <laughs> um, the reason, well, I love the traditional uh, I love being able to say oil on canvas or oil on linen. It's, it's just such a, an accepted traditional form, a traditional medium that goes back centuries. And so I want to stay within that tradition and I love working with canvas. The thing about this 14 foot canvas behind me is that if that were a solid piece of wood, I wouldn't be able to get it out of the, out of the studio. I couldn't transport it. Um, so with that canvas, I roll it up, I restretch it on the site, and then we hang it and install it. Um, that make, canvas makes things portable in that sense. Um, but in terms of, like, I think we talked about, like, beyond oil on canvas, I've started to do mural work, which is working on, a, on an existing structure, right? I'm painting lacquer on furniture. I just finished that project. So I'm... I'm branching out to see what else I can do with it. Um, but you're right, I absolutely love the hard surface. So an oil on board would make more sense and there are certainly those possibilities for me. But I haven't, I haven't gotten there yet. I'm still sticking with my traditional oil on canvas or linen, so. Paul, can you talk about that, that big commission last year? I think at the time, that was the largest piece you had done, and maybe that like how largest. that happened? Uh, my good friend Ernie De La Torre uh, also works here in the building. He called me up one day and he says, I have a commission for you. And what they had done, they had sold some work of mine before, but uh, smaller scale. And what they had done, uh, they put, they took one of my images off my website that they thought would go well into the project. And then they photoshopped it on this dining room wall that was like 14 feet, you know, by whatever. And so he called me up and said, we really like this painting. We want you to do the same painting, but bigger, right? And so, or at least that was the inspiration. And working with Ernie and his team, because they were still constructing the room, they were still uh, the room wasn't, wasn't even done by the time I started. So I had to sort of hunt around and find where they were going with the design. And, and we sort of just sort of collaborated together. I, I built a couple, uh, I, I painted a few studies for it, got their feedback, and I was like, okay, I think I know where they want to go with it. But um, that painting, yeah, it was the largest one I had done. That's why I had to get a bigger studio. I had always wanted to paint at that scale, so I chose, I got really lucky and found this space. Um, the waiting list for this building is like several years long, but I'm subletting from my friend George Lewis. And so he was able, we're able to now work together um, in the same space. We love it, it's a great relationship, but I'm now able to paint these, these large canvases. So yeah. I finished it, we, we installed it, everything went smoothly. It's on this wall down in, in Philadelphia. It's just, it's, at the time, you know, I, I, uh, 
he, when he told me how big it was, I was like, okay, no problem. <laughs> and then after I hang up the phone, I'm like, how am I going to do this? <laughs> you know? um, but you figure it out. You know, I figured it out and made it work. So as they say, you fake it until you make it, right? Yeah. Um, and that was on aluminum. Were those treasure bars aluminum? I feel like I saw a picture of the back of that at some point. They, they were aluminum bar stretchers, but all, all of those aluminum frames, they have, um, they have like pine strips so that you can staple into. So you, you wrap it around and there's, there's a wood element to it so that you can staple into it. But yeah, at that size, you definitely want to stay, you want to go with aluminum. Very cool. Yeah. That was a great project. I mean, I, 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 uh, I also sold that client one of the studies I did for the painting. So he has two pieces of mine now. So. I love that story. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm not an art ship could go across country, it could go wherever, you know, to install yeah. it. Yeah. But I, I personally went down to Philadelphia to unroll the canvas and stretch it back on the stretcher. So, yeah. That's great. Um, does anyone else have any questions that they would like to ask Paul? Donna, make sure you unmute. Hi, Paul. Hi, so Donna. Do you still sell your abstract um, paintings that you did years and years ago? Or are you just doing all techno babble now? Uh, a lot of that older work is in storage. I just, I, I filled up a storage unit and then I had to move into a bigger storage unit and I filled that one up. Um, a part of me wants to go back and paint over that. <laughs> you know, find an old painting that, that was at one time complete. But right now, I like that as a record of where I was at the time. I don't want to destroy that. So I have a lot of old work. Um, and now it's just techno babble. But all of that experience comes into each of the new paintings I'm doing. Um, the big question I have now is what's next after techno babble? Like, there's got to be what's going on after you know it's evolution i like it that's good i think i think um i think we need to get you a painting out of, out in utah <laughs> i'd love one yeah fantastic does anyone else have any questions for paul i'm not seeing any hands go up um well, and we're, we're at about time. Paul, do you have any, anything you want to say to kind of wrap it up? Um, let's see. I, I don't know. I just, I just feel so lucky. I just want people to know how lucky I, I feel to be not just um, painting full time, but also doing this during a very difficult time for the country and for the world. Um, this, is, this is a hard moment in history. And to be able to come in here and paint and sort of forget all of that and keep working, uh, you know, I was, I was pretty thrilled last summer to be doing this full time. And that's why I did make the jump to full time. But to be able to do this during a very serious time for all of us is very humbling. So I feel very lucky to be, um, to be doing this right now of all times. Um, art has always been there for me during like the difficult times in my life. And this is certainly one of those times. Um, so I just, you know, it's, it, it's, it really put new meaning into my work to be able to do this now of all, during, during the pandemic. So that's all I got to say. I just, I absolutely love what I'm doing. I, if, if you invite me to your home, you're, you're likely to find some techno Bible drawings like in your bathroom or something. Like I'm just, I'm just like putting this stuff everywhere. And um, it's, it's just a part of who I am now. It, it reflects who I was, but it's, it's all good. So I'm very happy to be, be working right now. Beautiful, beautiful. I I I wish I could say hi to everybody who, who came. Um, a lot of you are friends and family. I love you all very much. So thank you. Thanks, Paul. We love your work. 
Thanks, Richard. Uh, yeah, I learned so much about you and your process today. I'm so grateful for yeah, this. Uh, for this, this time. is such a great idea. Yes, yeah. um, the Art Center. We are doing three of these a week. Uh, yeah. So, and we kind of, I think we have them online for next week, and we're doing one tomorrow at 1 p.m. with Kate Savell. Um, so it's so wonderful to see everyone. Thank you for supporting nonprofit arts right now too. We're supporting nonprofit arts and artists um, by doing this. So it's greatly appreciated. Um, hanging up is my least favorite part of these because I can <laughs> see everybody smiling right now and all these wonderful right. things in the comments. Um, before I hang up, if you want to copy and paste that, that link of uh, upcoming events or the other one, please do. Um, Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thanks, Charlotte. Yay. And for all, I, I hate doing it. I'm going to do it. <laughs>